It's December 23rd, 2012, and this is the Energy Education Podcast. I'm Kevin Hurley. Today on the show, we'll discuss two U.S. nuclear power plants that are operating beyond what they were originally designed for. We'll discuss the design bases of Nebraska's Fort Calhoun plant and how original calculations that went into designing the containment support structure are now known to be flawed. We'll also talk more about the San Onofre plant, what it was designed to handle, and what's actually happening. Joining us to discuss these issues is Fairwind's chief nuclear engineer, Arnie Gunderson. All coming up next. Let's get right to it. The topic of today's show is plants operating beyond their design bases. We have two plants that we'd like to talk about, Fort Calhoun and San Onofre. Fort Calhoun is a plant, a nuclear plant in Nebraska that experienced severe flooding last year, and there was some concern about that. Arnie, you were talking about that at the time, but some new information may be raising some cause for concern. Uh, can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, this is, um, uh, you know, Fort Calhoun has been shut down since April of 2011 um, because of the flood. And um, uh, they were looking at what did the flood do to the structure, what did it do to the foundations. Well, as part of that process, they just discovered that there were problems inside the nuclear containment uh, and they just had a meeting with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission about those problems. But what's fascinating about it is that these problems that they just discovered aren't related to the flooding at all, and they go back decades. So, Arnie, how long ago were these plants designed? How did they plan to meet these design bases? I mean, these plants are from designed in the 60s and 70s, right? Yeah, these plants were designed when I was uh, uh, in college and just out of college. And uh, this particular one, Fort Calhoun, was designed with hand calculations and slide rules in the 1960s. Now, what they discovered in, uh, as a result of trying to uh, see the condition of the plant after the flood, well, they discovered that those calculations from the 60s had errors, those calculations also are, some of them are missing, and then um, some of them are just plain incomplete. Uh, I, I, we're posting the slides on the site from the NRC presentation, and, and um, listeners might want to click on slide number 12. But Omaha Public Power District admits, here's the quote, that there were, quote, incorrect and incomplete or missing calculations there were inconsistencies between the calculations and the drawings. There were incomplete consideration of all load combinations. And there were simple numerical errors. Well, I mean, what did they do right back in the 60s if they had all these problems? Omaha Public Power is trying to limit the scope of this to just look at these beams inside the containment. But my God, if they had all these kinds of problems, for um, you know, that went undetected for five decades now, how many other nuclear calculations should be suspect? I hope the NRC is going to ask those kinds of questions. So what we're actually looking at then are, are support structures in the containment, right? Yeah, we're looking at the beams that hold things like the uh, nuclear reactor up or the, the steam generators and the pressurizer. Um, yeah, they're major structural beams. And what they discovered is that in the normal day-to-day -day life of the power plant, they'll hold just fine. But if there's a pipe break, the stresses and the shaking of the system are such that those beams inside the containment are likely to fail. So, uh, you know, the, the, the people out in, uh, in, in Omaha are certainly uh, uh, thankful that there wasn't a nuclear accident because if there had been, um, it's likely the insides of the plant would have shaken to the point where the emergency core cooling wouldn't have worked. So this is about being able to simply hold up the weight of the reactor in the case of an accident. Now, Arnie, the Omaha Public Power District is just now coming forward with this information. Are they just now learning about this? Well, the um, reporters who were at the public hearing where this material was presented said that they've known about it for two decades. Um, it, it, there's a great write-up by an organization called Simply Info 
um, that that addresses the public hearing here. And and I frankly I was dumbfounded. I mean, how can you know about incorrect, incomplete, missing calculations, numerical errors for two decades, and not do anything about it? You know, it speaks to the the NRC oversight of these reactors. The NRC has resident inspectors on site. And the NRC will always say, well, we have our personnel on site at all times. But the fact of the matter is they only have two people. And there's another 700 at the, uh, at the utility. So the resident inspectors become just box checkers. They walk around and make sure that every, every um, I is dotted and every T is crossed. But they never go back and, and look at these big questions like, how is this plant designed and, and are the calculations uh, upon which it's based um, even accurate? So we're finding here at Fort Calhoun that uh, the design bases for the plant, that all those hand calculations of a bunch of uh, you know, geeky engineers with slide rules back in the 60s are, um, are wrong, are missing, or, or just they, they didn't think the problem through fully. And yet, they're talking about starting back up in January. So there's a problem with these old calculations at the Fort Calhoun plant. Uh, there's concern that the weight-bearing structures may not be able to hold up the containment in the event of a, in the event of a problem. Uh, what could that mean? I mean, does it just uh, drop the containment? Yeah, what it means is that um, had there been a, uh, uh, an accident, had a pipe break, uh, occurred, the, the extra forces on the plant, not just the dead load of these things just sitting there and operating, but the dynamic twists and turns of the plant as, um, as a pipe were a break, uh, would likely have caused these things to fail. You know, they, they went back in and they started to look at different beams. And uh, they said, well, let's look at these six beams and see if you know, this is just a, a rare problem or uh, is it systemic. And they looked at six, and they found all six were wrong. So it's clearly an indication of a, of a systemic problem. And yet, you know, this is coming out of NRC Region 4, which is the part of the, the NRC that, that handles all the nuclear plants in the, in the western part of the, the country. And yet, you know, here's Region 4 not asking the big picture questions like, well, if these problems are true in this small little piece of information you're looking at, how can we be sure about all of the safety calculations you've done? I don't see those big picture questions being asked. The, the other big picture question is, you know, you guys have known about this for two decades. Why didn't you tell us? And when you say you guys have known about this, you're talking about the staff at Fort Calhoun or the NRC? Yeah, the management at Fort Calhoun apparently has known about this problem for years, if not decades. And, and yet the NRC is just now being made aware of it. You know, when, when in the nuclear industry, if an employee were, were to um, know about missing calculations or incomplete calculations or incorrect calculations and not tell immediately about these problems, they would be fired, and then the NRC is a process where they're banned from the nuclear industry for five years. I don't see the NRC even considering that for Fort Calhoun's management. If this happened to a person, that person's career would be destroyed, but yet here Fort Calhoun let it occur for likely several decades, according to Simply Info, and yet I don't see anybody at the NRC saying, why should we let you start back up in 2013 or even 2014 for that matter? How can we trust the management at Omaha Public Power? So all of these, uh, well, at least in this case, these old calculations, inaccuracies in these old calculations, missing information, maybe the engineers put the dot in the wrong place or forgot to carry a zero, um, whatever that is, do you suspect that that's limited to the Fort Calhoun plant only at this point? Well, there's two parts to that. First off, I don't think it's just limited to the containment at Fort Calhoun. Within Fort Calhoun, if they've got these problems on the beams inside the containment, I can't imagine why they wouldn't have problems uh, throughout all of the calculations. Um, but we not have a blind eye to 
design bases issues at other plants. So within NRC Region 4, it's not just Fort Calhoun that they are you know, deliberately giving a buy to. Um, here's Fort Calhoun, and they're saying, well, you know, we'll, we'll seriously consider starting you guys up in January of 2013. Um, we see the same behavior in NRC Region 4 on San Onofre. All right, Arnie, I do want to talk about San Onofre. Uh, before that, though, I just want to uh, touch base with you about your fundraising goals. Fairwinds has a goal of $50,000. Where are we along the way? You know, we posted a fundraiser about, about a month ago uh, trying to get enough, um, enough money to move forward into 2013, and I'm really gratified by the results. We are 80% there. We thought we'd need about $50,000 to get through 2013. And um, so far, people have donated about $40,000. So we're really close to our goal. It's so gratifying to walk down to the mail and, and, and get small checks from many people who really care about the message of, of fair rents. And to those people who have sent, I really appreciate it. And in the last week here before um, the fiscal year ends, uh, if, you, if you haven't sent, I urge you, please consider uh, sending a donation on to Fairwinds. So, Arnie, moving on to San Onofre. Today we are talking about design bases issues. Uh, tell me, what's going on at San Onofre right now? Well, if, if you're a frequent visitor to the Fairwinds site, you'll know there's about four reports up there for uh, Friends of the Earth about problems at the steam generators at uh, San Onofre. Just real quick, they replaced the steam generators and... In, a, in less than a year, uh, they had uh, multiple tube uh, fail, failures inside a steam generator. Steam generator is like a forest of little tubes, not much bigger than your finger, um, but they go 30 or 40 feet high, and uh, they began to vibrate and damage each other. So just to clarify, Arnie, the steam generator tubes are carrying very hot radioactive water through non-radioactive water so they can transfer the heat but contain the radiation. Is that, that's how it's working? My God, Kevin, we're going to make an engineer out of you yet. Yeah. <laughs> he said that last week. <laughs> um, okay, go on. So what, what, is, what are the problems with these tubes? Okay, so well, what happened in, uh, in January of uh, last year, the, uh, the plant sprung a leak in one of these tubes. And they went back in and they did a pressure test. And eight tubes failed the pressure test. Now, what that means is that had there been an accident, uh, eight of these tubes would have likely burst. And the plant's design basis, what it's designed for, is one tube bursting. So basically, there, the, con the conditions inside the plant were eight times worse than anybody ever expected. So had there been the accident, had there been this thing called the main steam line break accident, not one pipe, but at least eight and possibly even many more. Uh, they did wind up ultimately plugging 1,300 tubes. So perhaps hundreds of tubes might have failed. But the, the important thing here, getting back to design bases and, and region NRC Region 4, the plant clearly was operating outside of its design bases. It was designed for one tube breaking, and in fact, at least eight would have broken, if not more. Now, what that means is that all of the emergency planning structure would have been useless. We're talking about an accident that could have been eight times worse than what the, um, the state of California is prepared to respond to. What, what can happen in the event of this accident is uh, you might have to evacuate all the way out to Los Angeles and all the way down to the Mexican border. This was a big deal. When these tubes fail, they would leak about 5,000 gallons of water every minute out of the nuclear reactor into places where it never was designed to be. So you've got radioactive water leaving the nuclear containment and heading into places that aren't designed to retain it. But more importantly, the plant is not designed to make up 5,000 gallons of water into the nuclear core. So the nuclear core might not have been cooled and you might have had a meltdown. So the, this problem is, uh, I think, the most significant near miss we've had in the last 20, uh, at least 10 years. And the NRC in Region 4 
is ignoring the fact that San Onofre was operating well beyond what it was designed for. Now, here's what's, uh, what the NRC's position is on this. What the NRC in Region 4 is saying, well, yeah, we know eight tubes or more would have broken, and we know it would have been a much worse accident than you can, um, uh, you can design for. But the chance of a mainstream steam line break was only about double. So because the probability didn't go up too, too much, we're going to give them a buy. We're going to say, okay, you weren't really act, acting outside of your design bases if the NRC had determined that it was operating outside its design bases, they could levy a $150,000 a day fine for the 18 months that the plant was running. It could easily add up to a billion-dollar penalty. They don't want to go there. So let me try to make this a little more understandable for me. These tubes are carrying radioactive water at very high pressures in order to transfer heat and run the turbines. They planned, what I'm understanding you say, is that one tube at the most could break. What you're telling me is that, there, yes, there is the problem of this radioactive water leaking into a non-radioactive area, and that's one problem to deal with. But the main problem, if eight tubes break as opposed to the one tube that they planned for, is too much water would be lost, and they wouldn't be able to make up for it and cool the reactor. Is that right? That's it, exactly. None of the uh, reactor simulators are designed to handle an, an accident where eight tubes break. There's simply not enough water to inject back into the nuclear reactor uh, as it's depressurizing in order to prevent the core mm -hmm. from being covered, which mm -hmm. means you know, you're going to get uh, tube failures. And, and likely, in the case of an eight-tube rupture accident, I can't see how a, a meltdown would have been, uh, could have been averted. It's outside of what the plants are designed for, and it's outside of what the operators are trained to handle. And these tubes are only about as big as a finger? Yeah, they're only about as big around as your finger, and they're, of course, uh, you know, 30 or 40 feet high, and they have a U-tube on the top. We have a a video on this on the website from back in the uh, spring that we talk about what these tubes uh, look like and uh, you know if somebody wanted to go back they could go back and take a look at that uh, that video so yeah they there's a forest of these tubes uh, more than 9000 of these tubes in the steam generator and they were beating each other up hitting each other to the point where eight were were ready to fail and did fail when, uh, when San Onofre ultimately did a pressure test that would have simulated what would have happened had there been a main steam line break. So if eight tubes can lose that much water, then the water traveling through these tubes must be under tremendous pressure. Oh yeah, a couple thousand pounds per square inch. So Arnie, how does all of this then affect the emergency planning around this sort of, you know, densely populated radius around this plant? Yeah, there's 8 million people living within five, uh, 50 miles of the plant. And uh, right now the emergency plan only goes out to 10 miles. But 10 miles even includes um, uh, Camp Pendleton, which is the largest marine base in the world. 50,000 Marines are on that base uh, at some times during the year. Now, we, we need to think about what would be the ramifications to national security if we had to abandon Camp Pendleton. The plant itself sits right in the middle of Camp Pendleton, and uh, because of that, um, you know, should there have been uh, an accident, uh, an evacuation of you know, 10,000 to 50,000 Marines would have been required with all their equipment left behind. It's From a national security standpoint, it's not something you'd want. And then if you just look up the road, you know, you wind up in big cities like Irvine, California, and a little further north than that is L.A., a little further south is San Diego. So huge cities that are um, with 8 million people. But more equally important, not more importantly, is that L.A. is the biggest port in the world for U.S. imports and exports. So if we had to shut down L.A. because of an accident at San Onofre, 
we would be effectively damaging the country, perhaps irrevocably. So the consequences of the design failures by Southern California Edison at the, um, at the San Onofre plant are huge. And yet the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is like an ostrich in the sand. They're refusing to acknowledge that if a main steam line break happened, basically every one of the systems we put in place to, um, to protect the public would have failed. That's a lot riding on a little pipe. Yeah, it's a lot riding on a little pipe, and it's a lot riding on a, a, a little emergency plan. Arnie, thanks for joining us again this week. All right, Kevin, thanks for having me. Um, in spite of this gloomy news, um, I hope you have a happy holiday, and I hope our viewers do too. All right, you too. Well, that about does it for this week's edition of the Energy Education Podcast. 